so we're going to kind of look at chapter one. We're going to kind of nod our heads and go, yeah, that's a chapter one. And then we're going to skip to chapter two. No, I'm kidding. We're going to take a brief look at it. But chapter one in these textbooks is always stuff like, what is a computer? And you know what a computer is. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on chapter one. There's not going to be any questions on an exam or a quiz. No quiz on chapter one. But we got to see if there's anything worthwhile in it. What is a computer? It's a blinky box with lights on it. Now, obviously, computers are, you know, everywhere now. There's computers in your microwave oven and your fridge and your watch and everything. It's a programmable machine designed to follow instructions. And computers have actually existed for a long, long time, longer than you might think. If you've heard of steampunk, which is the idea that computers were invented in the 1800s, but they were steam-powered and they had gears instead of, you know, transistors, that was almost pretty much a reality. It's just that the manufacturing tolerances for making all the gears and stuff like that wasn't quite there so that the people who were trying to make it, their grants ran out because they, you know, they couldn't make it to the exact tolerances. But they actually had designed a working computer using gears. And it was a guy named Charles Babbage. And the woman who invented the programming language for it was named Ada Lovelace. And so there's a programming language called Ada based on her name. I guess Babbage never got a language named after him. Poor guy. But anyways, it has subsequently been built nowadays because nowadays, of course, you know, with our machine tooling and stuff like that, we could make all the gears precise enough. But it had everything you would consider a computer, meaning it had a place where data could be stored, what we would call variables, although they didn't have names, but there were spaces, right? There were numbers where you could write, read, and write from. It had a place where the program would be loaded and then it had a way of taking input in the form of punch cards believe it or not the reason they had punch cards is because looms in England you know the textile factories the looms were programmed with punch cards you know people were even people were smart even in the 1800s and you know, it had the output in the same format you know it could produce punches and if it had worked it would have been awesome but like I said couldn't get it to work. Finally, their funding was cut off. But people have subsequently built them. And you can go to museums or go to, you know, the IBM Center or whatever and, and ogle at them, and they're pretty awesome. So computers have been around for quite a while, even before that. There were these little boxes. This is like 1700s. Pascal's computer is what this one was called, or calculator. The idea behind that one is that you could set up a system of where it had gears inside it and you could put in some number and then you could tell what kind of permutation you were going to do on it to perform a polynomial equation. And so you would set your input on it, you'd set the wheels and you'd spin it and you'd get an answer. And then why would you want to do that? Well, because, you know, by the 1700s and stuff like that, business was becoming big business and you've probably heard of the, like the East India Company you know that the shipping company and they, they were so incredibly rich that rich that they could fund colonies like New Amsterdam was owned by the East India Company right and they eventually became New York imagine one company owning you know New York so anyway you need the ability to move, move big numbers around the same for science right people were starting to become interested like you know in the positions of the stars and estimates of the orbits and stuff like that and logarithms, they wanted to be able to measure fractions very precisely and do large calculations. And they didn't have pocket calculators to do all this stuff. So they had books of tables. And nowadays nobody knows how to calculate multiplication with logarithms. Maybe you know, but you're smarter than I am if you do. But that's what, you know, all the slide rules that this, you know, the nerds used to have, you know, in the 40s and 50s and stuff like that were for, is to do multiplications of incredibly large numbers just by, you know, sliding a slider on a ruler and being able to it would do multiplication of logarithms. And so in order to have the logarithms like that, you had to have tables. In order to have the tables, they found kind of libraries, you know, universities, whatever, had books full of tables. The logarithms of all the numbers from like one to 10 million or something like that. I may be exaggerating the size of the number, you know, for base two and all the logarithms of the numbers from one to a million and then another base. And so some poor student at Cambridge or whatever has had to sit there 
with pen and paper and calculate these things by hand and write a number down in the book. And calculate it by hand and write another number down in the book. And I, I hope that they were rewarded somehow with good grades or something for doing that. So, of course, the, uh, the manuals were filled with errors, right? I mean, the, the books were filled with errors. So, what those calculators were designed to do, well, I'll give you an example. What if we have any... Can you all see this when I write on the board, or is the glare just too bad and I need to go turn the projector off? Turn the projector off? Nobody's saying turn the projector off. All right, so say we had 2x squared plus x plus 2. That's going to be our equation. And we're going to solve it for a series of values. So what is that for 0? Well, I can kind of figure that out. 0 plus 0 plus 2. What is it for 1? 2 plus 1 plus 2. Did I get that right? Is that 5? Yeah. What is it for 2? Well, that's 2 squared is 4. That's 8. 9, 10, 11, 12. My brain's going to break at the next one probably. What is it for 3? 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18 plus another 3 is 21. 20. Is it 23? Yes. Okay. That'll be enough to prove the point. What's the difference between these two guys? That's a difference of 3. What's the difference between 5 and 12? 7. What's the difference between 12 and 23? 11. All right, what's the difference between 3 and 7? 4. What's the difference between 7 and 11? 4. We could guess that, that if we were going to do 4, we want to figure out what that number is. All we'd have to do is add 4 to that number, which would be 15, and add 15 to that number, which would be 38. Like that, like that. And so with the way we could verify that. 4 squared is 16 times 2 is 32, plus another 4 is 36, and 2 more is 38. So you saw that by getting a pattern, it'd be very easy to fill out this table, right, from that point on. You just keep at, you know, doing that, doing that, doing that. Or what if you could turn a wheel on a, on a mechanical calculator and have it do that, right, add the 4 to the 15 or whatever. So you can enter the numbers for the polynomial equation. Right? I'm going to put a 2 there on the dial, and I'm going to put a 1 there on the dial, and I'm going to put a 2 there on the dial, and I'm going to give it the starting values. You know, you know, do that, and you can crank out those tables really fast. That's not quite what we think of as a calculator today, because it's not programmable, really. Right? You're just setting its input data. But, close enough. And a lot of people did have those. Those weren't like the uh, Babbage's engine where, uh, you know, it wasn't possible to make them at that day. So the computer is designed to follow instructions. Specifically, it needs a place to be able to hold instructions, and it needs a place to be able to hold data. And hopefully it has some form of input and output devices as well, right? So that, you know, you can touch the screen or move the mouse and the keyboard, and it will display something for you. So what is the program? The instructions in computer memory that do something. The programmer is the person who makes the programs. This sounds like kind of like the house that Jack built, right? You know, the, the mouse ate the grain that did the whatever, whatever. Feel free to read the chapter. All right, this is useful. Everything ultimately boils down to a zero or a one in a computer, except for apparently quantum computers, which I have no idea how they work and stuff like that. But ultimately, our information goes down to either being a zero or a one. Where zero is the absence of a charge, or where's the absence of electricity flowing? or it's a blank spot on a CD-ROM, and a 1 is a presence of a charge, or the presence of electricity flowing, or it's a pit on the CD-ROM, or whatever. So your RAM is just composed of a gazillion transistors, all capable of holding a 0 or a 1. And they're all clustered in groups 
the smallest addressable unit of memory in uh, the majority of modern computers is a byte, which is 8 bits. So a bit is either a 0 or 1. And then a byte is a collection of 8 bits. And I do save these notes, but I also encourage you to write them down if you're a note taker, you know, because it burns it into your brain. But you'll always be able to find the, uh, the day's notes afterwards. So byte equals 8 bits. How, much, how many different values then can you have if you have 8 bits? Well, if you have 1 bit, you only have two possible states, right? 1 bit is two possible states. So it can hold two different values, right? On or off. But if you have two bits, well, you have four possible states, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Well, if you have three bits, somebody tell me, is it going to be 6 or is it going to be 8? Just take a guess. Yep, it's going to be 8, right? And I'm not going to write out all the possibilities, but 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on, right? All the way out to 1, 1, 1, 1. That's 8. So if you spot the pattern, it's doubling each time. And if you wanted to express it mathematically, it's 2, you know, to the power of. I'm going to express this differently. The power of 2 to n, where n is the number of bits. Now, normally, if I was going to write a formula, just colloquially, I would do something like 2 like that, 2 to n. We all know that means power. Or if you're a Python programmer, I would type that. However, this language doesn't have an exponent operator. You have to use the power function to raise something to an exponent, which is why I'm not writing it like that, why I'm not writing it like that. I'm going to delete those. Anyways, that's the formula for calculating how many possible values there are. And as I mentioned, the smallest addressable memory unit in modern RAM is 8 bits. It didn't have to be like that. That was just an arbitrary choice. And in the 60s and things like that, people were experiencing with experimenting with different word sizes. Like, okay, the smallest unit is 15 bits or, you know, whatever. So we can guess, you know, that 4 bits would be 16 different values, meaning that it could hold the numbers 0 through 15, right? Because that is 16. Just like if you have four different possible values, how high can you count? We have to start with zero. You have to start with nothing. So zero, one, two, three. So this would give you the possible values of zero through seven, which is eight possible different values. Seven is the largest value that can be expressed with three bits. Fifteen is the largest value that can be expressed with four. By the time you get to eight, it's two to the power of eight, which is 256 different possibilities which is 0 to 255. So I kind of have a hunch as to why they chose 8 bits, because that's enough to contain a letter, a typewriter character. And why do I say that? Well, what if we wanted to invent a character set that would hold all the letters and numbers and punctuation on a keyboard? Well, we would need A through Z, which is 26. We would need a digit 0 through 9, which is 10. And then I don't know how many punctuation there are. Let's pretend that there's 10 pieces of punctuation. I'm sure that there's more than that. Okay, let's, let's, let's get wild and crazy and say that we have 20 punctuation, right? And so 26 letters, 10 numbers, 20 punctuation, that's like 56, right? So did we need 8 bits to hold 56? No. Let's find out how many bits it would take to hold 56. Now, it's going to be a power of 2. Right, really, because all of these is a power of 2. So 5 could equal, we could hold 32 different values, right? 6, we could hold 64 different values. Well, that looks good, right? 7, we could hold 128. So if we had a character set that can comprise 56 different typewriter keys, we could store it in 6 bits. But what are we missing here? If we, if we had a typewriter that had only these keys, we're kind of missing something. Caps. Yeah, we've only got caps, and so we would need to be able to handle lowercase plus uppercase. So that would be another 26, which is like 82, or 80, yeah, something like that, which is more than 64. So it would take seven bits to encode the traditional typewriter in the form of text.
And people were doing this before the invention of computers. You know, those old movies where Spencer Tracy or, you know, Catherine uh, Hepburn or whatever, looking at a ticker tape. You know, or, you know, you have a teletype machine sending news from, you know, to the New York office. So that thing is effectively a computer. It's just a dumb terminal where you type something in and it sends a series of pulses to a printer located in another city. But in order to do that, they had to encode it, right? The letter had to be a certain number of, you know, sounds. And a different letter had to be another certain number of sounds. Maybe, maybe like rotary dialing on a telephone. Remember when you had to dial the eight, it would go dicky 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 dicky. You would dial the a two, and it would go dicky dicky. I don't know if that's what the sound sounded like or not. But they had to figure out coding systems even back then, back in the days of ticker tape and teletype machines. So seven would hold the alphabet and sort of punctuation, but it's easier to engineer electronics if you're working with powers of two. So why not round it up to eight? That's my theory as to why that became the standard. But being able to hold a number between 0 and 255 is, is not enough, right? You know, if you ask me, uh, you know, um, what I want my salary to be in dollars, I want to earn more than $255 a year. I'm going to need another variable size in order to hold, you know. So let's say that I want $10,000 a year. Uh, I'm going to work for that. Well, I need more bits than that. 2 to the power of n. I know that there's a logarithmic equation that you could use in order to figure out log base 2 of something. Uh, I'm not as mathy probably as you all are. Log 2 of 10,000. What's it going to say? Well, maybe that did work. Maybe it would take 14 bits in order to hold a number that large. So 2 to the power of 14. Yeah, yeah, that would be right. Okay. But again, powers of 2 are nice. So it would probably be 2 to the power of 16. We would probably want 16-bit numbers in order to hold numbers up to the tens of thousands. Right? And 16 bits gives you whatever 2 to the 16 is, which I think is 65,000. 2 to the power of 16, 65,000. 65536. Now, is that a big enough number? Well, my CEO is probably earning more than that. I need a, a, a larger data size. Well, why not, if 16 bit numbers can hold that, why not bump it up to 32 bit numbers? And you may remember, you may have heard the term like, eight, I have an 8 bit computer or my Nintendo had an 8-bit processor, but my Genesis and my Super Nintendo had a 16-bit processor. And then my Windows is a 32-bit operating system, but then I got Windows 7 and, or Windows 10, and it was a 64-bit operating system. The same idea. I'll broach that again. What's 2 to the 32? It's going to be a number up to about 2 billion. So 2 to the power of 32. Oh, 4 billion, excuse me. Okay. 2 to the power of 32 equals about 4 billion. And then how about a 64 bit? All right. So that would be 2 to the power of 64, which is going to be a mega huge number. There's no way I ever remember this. 2 to the power of 64. And this is going somewhere, by the way, which is 1 followed by 19 zeros. Or we could round it up maybe to 2 followed by 19 zeros, right? But anyways, it's equals 1.9 exponent to the 19, right? Huge values. Okay, so if you're going to be doing math with large numbers, you would not want to use 16-bit numbers. Depending on how large the numbers are, you may not even want to use 32-bit numbers. You might want to use these. So this is what's called in this language an int. An integer is a 32-bit value in this particular implementation of C. It used to be that C implementations could be anything. You could say, well, my integer is going to be 8 bits. And somebody else could say, well, my integer is going to be 16 bits. And my integer is going to be 32. You know, and, they, and they can. Nowadays, it's pretty much standardized that 
an integer is going to be at least 32 bits. And then you have the 64 bit, kind of the double wide size. And this has an absurd name, long long. I'm sorry it's an absurd name, but it is. There's supposed to be an intermediate one, just called long. And so the, an, an int is, 60, is 32 bits. A long is supposed to be 64 bits. And then a long long is supposed to be even bigger. But Microsoft has made it so that a long is the same size as an int. So it's also 32 bits. And then a long long is the next one up. And they're, they're free to do that, but if you use a different compiler, like on a Mac or, you know, on something under a Unix compiler, GCC or something like that, then it may be different. And that's just one of the quirks of C and C++, is that on different platforms, the standards may be a little bit different. So even though the code will probably compile for the different machines, there might be slight differences in the way that it behaves. And so you would need to test very thoroughly if you took your Windows C program and you try to compile it for Unix. So since these two are the same, I'm just going to delete this one. If I need a number that's less than 4 billion, I could choose to store it in an int. If I need a number that's greater than 4 billion, I would choose to store it in a long long. Sounds like the name of a panda, right? Long long at the Washington DC Zoo made it this day for the, you know, whatever. And um, it's even that's not good enough, right? That's not, well, for one thing, integers are whole numbers only. And we don't like whole numbers all the time, right? We like fractional numbers as well. Can't express pi as a whole number, right? And also, this one peters out at t times 10 to the 19. There are much larger numbers, right? So. There are also floating point data types. There are ints, which are whole numbers. So I'm just going to say that these are integer types, whole numbers. And there's several different integer types, really. There are shorts, which are smaller than ints. They're 16 bits. There's ints, and then there's long longs. These are 16 bits, so they hold much smaller values, right, up to 65,000. Ints are 32-bit values, so they can hold one of four billion different possibilities. And then long longs, you know, are 64 bits, so they can hold huge numbers. But there are floating points as well. Floating points, you have kind of a problem because you, and my brain always blips on this. You have the exponent, and what's the part in front of the exponent called? Maybe mantissa. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Well, the base, I'm going to go with mantissa. So, like, if you have 3.0 times 10, yeah, so the base would be also important. To, underneath it all, these are stored in base 2, which is an interesting thing. So, anyways, so if we wanted to store that, the 3 is the mantissa. And the exponent, and are you going to have to remember every single one of these terms? No, I just kind of want this to sink in, but not, you know, so vivid that you, you know, you have flashbacks to it while driving home. Then uh, it has an exponent of 6. If you took your 32 bits, you might say, well, I'm going to devote 16 bits of it to the mantissa. And then 16 bits of it to the exponent. Which would mean that you could come up with numbers, you know, up to something, whatever it was, e to the whatever the largest number a 16-bit value could hold, 65,000, right? But that's kind of nice, but you might want larger exponents than that. I think I'm making a mistake there, and I think the mistake that I'm making is that these are in powers of 2, because I don't think you can put numbers that large into it. But anyways, you see the problem is that in order to make a floating point number, and you still only have the same number of ints, you have a less amount of precision because you also have to store the exponent, right? So, floating point math is not as precise as integer math. You, know, you always know that 2 times 8 is exactly 16, but you're not exactly sure that 
0.3333 plus 0.333 plus 0.333 is going to equal 1, right? It ought to. 1 third plus 1 third plus 1 third it should equal 1. But it had to round it off, right? You can't do 0.33 forever. It can only hold a certain number of digits, maybe 10 places of accuracy or 16 or something like that. 0.333, and it's even worse because they get converted to base 2 and base 10 and base 2. We have fractional numbers. They're not convert cleanly all the time. So anyways, floating point math can be imprecise. You can get rounding errors. But we have floating point types and because floating point math is incredibly important, right? We're not only dealing with integer numbers. Now, this isn't going to make sense in the future, and I think I got that wrong. And I know that that's not actually what the mantissa and the exponent are. The mantissa takes more bits than what I said, and then the exponent takes fewer. So I'm going to delete that as well. I'm going to delete that as well. We're just going to know that there are floating point types which hold no, fractional numbers, right? 3.1, you know, a million 25.2, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.000943, right? All those are floating point numbers. Even 0.0, .0 is a floating point number because it's got that decimal point. And so there are two different floating point types of note. There's one called float, which is 32 bits. And then there's one called double. It's a double wide, 64. Now these hold really, really large numbers. Bigger than long longs, which we decided could store up to like 1.9 exponent 19. Even a float can hold a number larger than that because all it has to do is crank up the exponent, right? You know, if you set some number exponent to 20, it's already larger than the largest value that a long, long can hold. I don't remember the maximum size that a float or a double can hold. We'll, we'll see them later. Just go ahead and always use double, though. Even though it looks like, ooh, it uses more memory. Well, it's only an additional two bytes. Sorry, an additional four bytes because each byte is... Uh, is 8 bits? Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Is that double uh, what the presentation mentioned on variables and positions? Yep, yep, yep. And so we can define our variables as double. That's where this is going, is what data types we choose to hold different data values. My rules of thumb are use an int unless you need something bigger. But use a double unless you need some. And don't bother using a float because, like I said, you can have floating point errors. And if you use the larger data type, then the floating point errors are reduced. They're much smaller. They're much less likely to occur. And don't be freaked by the sound, the, by the term error. We'll come up with examples. You know, but just like I said, if you do 1 divided by 3 times 3, it ought to equal 1. Well, in floating point math, it wouldn't. You'd have little rounding errors. And to minimize the rounding errors, you should always use doubles. Use these, not these, if you need to store a floating point number. Use these unless you need these. Unless you need larger. Now, I have ignored a key component. I'll just mention it, which is that these, this method of calculating the largest size and stuff like that ignores negative numbers, right? Because I said that if you have a number of 256, it could hold a value of 0 through 255. Well, there's no way to put a negative number in there. So what they do is they use the first bit, and I'll talk about all this again, to indicate whether it's a positive or a negative number. And then that gives you the ability to go from negative 127 to positive 127, right? You cut it in half in order to get some negative numbers. And so the largest number that an int can really store is about 2 billion. But on the flip side, you get some negative numbers. You get up down to negative 2 billion. So I should change this to say that an integer can hold up to about 2 billion. I should put that on the, on the next slide. And that a long long can hold whatever that number is divided by 2, positive or negative. 
And don't be freaked out, guys. If, you, if your eyes are starting to roll up at this, right, which mine would be at this point, it's not like you have to know this stuff hard and fast, like you have to have it memorized just because we've mentioned it at this point. But I want it to sort of swim in the background of your mind so that the next time we hit it, it sinks in a little bit more. So this looks like it'll be about, you know, 18 zeros. So the largest value that a long one can, and I'll answer your question, I'm not ignoring you, can hold is about 2 to the power of 9, or 2 exponent 19. All right, yes ma'am. Right, you use floating point types, and I would choose double. Exactly, and exactly. Right, and so you just have to kind of pick. Right, if it's a counter, you know, how many pigs do I own? You probably don't need floats. Yeah. I don't own 3.92 pigs. Well, maybe I do, but. Uh, you know, so for age or something, maybe people like to have that stored as a double so that I could say, well, I'm 32.175 years old. <laughs> but most people just say 32, right? So you just have to kind of pick in your brain. Oh, why don't, why, why don't I make everything a double? Well, because like I said, you can have those floating point numbers. And if all you're doing is adding whole numbers to whole numbers, don't make it a double. Okay, so you're really itchy to start actually doing some programming. And I kind of agree with you. So main memory. Memory is just an endless number of boxes where each box holds a byte. Right? If you have four gigabytes of RAM installed on your laptop, it can hold four billion bytes. Obviously, we're not going to count out to four billion. So it's just sequentially numbered from address zero onward. I kind of want to just open up Visual Studio. I ought to give some quiz questions over this to make y'all read the chapter even though I'm skipping it. Uh -huh. But uh, I think we have some programming we would rather do. So I'm going to go to the search box, the magnifying glass, type Visual Studio. I don't think I've created my boilerplate file. I need to do that this time. I'm going to save this boilerplate that I type in as a text file that I leave on my desktop just so that from now on I don't actually have to type in the pound sign include, pound sign include, pound sign include. But anyways, you're going to choose File, New Project. And by the way, on your machine at home, if you do File, New Project and you don't see a list item that says Visual C++, don't accept another one. Go to this thing not finding what you're looking for and go to the installer and find the C++ options and just accept the defaults at that point. Now we can't change the ones on the on the machines here, right? But but they're already set up to do C++, so so we're good. All right, this is lecture B. So I'm just going to call this name of this project lecture B. This uh, location looks really poor to me. I think I'm going to browse. It seemed like I did this last time and set it to save to my documents folder. Okay. And then I'm going to click OK. So I chose the empty project of a Visual C kind. All right. And then it comes up. And like I had somebody text me, and they don't have the solution explorer. So how can they do anything? And the answer is you can't. But the, the solution explorer is easy to get back if you choose view solution explorer. So if you ever need more room to type, you can just close the visual, you know, close all these guys. But then when you need the solution explorer, it's easy to bring back. Now I'm going to create a CPP file, a C++ file. So I'm going to add new item. And I know there's other places to add 
You could probably find it, but new, I don't know. I just do it from source files. Add new item. And I have to give it a name. Again, I'm going to call this one lecture B.cpp. We have a project named lecture B, and I'm sticking a file called lecture B.cpp in there. It defaulted be calling source.cpp, which is fine, but after you you create like 10 or 12 of these in a row, you're going to have 10 or 12 files called source.cpp, you know, and if you put them all in one directory on your flash drive or something, it's going to look kind of silly. So lecture, whoops, that's not how you spell lecture, not in this language, lecture b.cpp. All right, now it's time for the boilerplate. And I'm going to talk about what these pieces of the program are this time after I type them in. Pound sign include, or hash include, somebody decided it was supposed to be called Octothorpe, which is the silliest punctuation name ever. Less than IO stream, IO stream, greater than. And then pound sign include string. We wound up needing string last time, so from now on I'm just going to include it as a matter of course. It does not slow your program down to have extra pound sign includes. And like I said, I'll tell you what that does exactly in a minute. Now, last time I had a line that said using space namespace std. I'm going to type that, but I'm going to comment it out by putting two slashes, the one under the question mark, not the one above the inner key. And I'm, because I'm going to show you what that does. Using namespace std. I want you to have that line there so that later on we can so-called uncomment it out and it'll be ready to go. But for now, we're going to leave it commented out. All right, we have a few more lines of code to put into our boilerplate. Boilerplate meaning that pretty much we're going to be typing this every single book. Int main, open parentheses, close parentheses, you know, shift 9, shift 0. And on the next line, a curly brace. And then if you're using Windows, add system, parentheses, quote, double quotes, pause, end quote, end parentheses, semicolon, and then return 0 semicolon, and then a closing curly brace. That's our boilerplate. We need that in every program we run. This is for Windows only. If you uh, are going to do your development on a Mac or something like that, when you're entering this code in a Mac, then uh, leave that off. Otherwise, it'll just print out an error message on your screen. What it's doing is that there's underneath it all in Windows, there's a command called pause. And what does pause do? It press, displays a message, press any key to continue, and it sits there and waits. But if you go on a Mac and pop open the terminal and type in pause, it doesn't do anything. And I don't think it does anything on Linux either. There, but on those machines, if you run the program, it doesn't close the window when it's done. And what does that mean? Well, if I had this, comment it out. Well, first I'm going to show you what it looks like when it runs with that there. So I'm going to hit the green arrow that says local Windows debugger. And by the way, if you don't see that message, local Windows debugger there, if instead it says something like attached to process, it means that you did not create a project. And every CPP file has to be part of a project, which is a problem if you're just copying a CPP file around and you wish, you know, you wanted to show it to me and so you loaded it up in Visual Studio and then you wish you could compile it. Well, you have to create a project and put it in it. It's kind of cumbersome, but we get used to it. Okay, so I ran it. It says press any key to continue and then it goes away when I hit enter. If I don't have that there, then Windows just runs it and boom, closes it. You know, no matter how cool my output was, it closes it instantly. So that's why we stick it there. But on those other operating systems I mentioned, Linux and Mac, um, they don't they don't close the window when it's done running. So they don't need that command. You could stick other things in, instead of pause there. Anything that can be entered into the Windows command prompt could be typed there. I'm not sure what it would do. Like, what if we do, uh, this is just me experimenting, you don't have to do this. Like, system, parentheses, quote, dir, end quote, parentheses. I'm going to delete that line, lickety split. I'm just curious if it's going to do what I think it's going to do. Yeah, display the directory. 
kind of neat, but nah. Let's get rid of that. Okay, that's our boilerplate. To complete my boilerplate, I'm going to uncomment this out. But first I want to show you why we, why we use that statement. Okay, I want to display something to the screen. So we're going to use cout, c-o-u-t, like we did last time. c-o-u-t, arrow, arrow, double quote, hello world, exclamation point, end quote, semicolon. Now you'll notice it's underlined in red. Identifier cout is undefined. I can get it to work one of two ways. One is I could prefix it with std colon colon, which is saying it's part of a standard group of commands. And that means that every time I call C out, I would have to put that std colon colon in front of it. And if I wanted to use CIN, like we did on Tuesday, I'd also have to do std colon colon CIN. Now it's going to work. It's going to print hello world when I run it. Hello world. And I forgot to put that slash in at the end, so it's putting this press any key to continue message right there. So I'm going to add a slash in inside the double quote here. Or I could use an ENDL, but slash in just means new line. It's the backslash. It's the one above underneath the backscape base key and not under the question mark. Now when I run it, it behaves exactly like what I want. But to make our code cleaner, it's nice to be able to leave out that std colon colon. So in order to be able to leave out that std colon colon in front of cins and couts and a whole bunch of other things, we do this. And what this means is just assume that if you can't find the word that I type here, check to see if it's in this group of functions called std. And if it is, great, which it is. So it allows us to not specify it. It's like you're going to a family reunion. And if you know that it's the Thompson family reunion, then everybody there is going to be called Thompson. Now that's not strictly true, right? So let's pretend. And so if you're walking up to somebody and you don't know what family reunion they're at, you might address them by their full name, Fred Thompson. But if you are at the family reunion and you know it's a Thompson family reunion, you can just call them Fred. Stupid example, I'm sorry. But you get the idea. I was able to leave out that std colon colon, which I would have to repeat every single time I did C out and CIM by adding this line. And so that's why we're going to do that. Now, there's some drawbacks that we may talk about later about doing that, and there may be some reasons we don't want to do that. So this is our boilerplate. This is our Hello World boilerplate. I feel like saving this. I'm going to just use Notepad and save a copy of it to the desktop. I'm going to copy the whole... Well, I better... Yeah, I guess I did test it. <clears throat> Maybe I didn't. Make sure it works, guys, if you're typing in. If you're just watching, it's okay. All right, so that worked. I'm going to copy all that highlight it, copy it, I'm going to load up notepad, go to the magnifying glass, type in notepad, I'm going to paste what I just typed, and I'm going to do save as, and I'm going to save it to my desktop to make it really easy to find, boilerplate.txt. And that way I can just copy and paste this stuff. Whenever I need it, I'll just go and grab that file and paste it, rather than spend, you know, two minutes typing it. You don't have to do that, but if you're a fast typist, you know, whatever. But save yourself some time. Some source code editors will create a lot of this stuff as soon as you make a file. I'm going to stop mentioning Macs if nobody's using a Mac. Who's going to be using a Mac in this class? Okay, okay, good. I'll keep mentioning Macs. If you're using Xcode and you create a new file, I believe it fills in some of the boilerplate for you. I need to make sure I give you my documents about Xcode, using Xcode. Okay, cool. Where were we going? Oh yeah, data, right? I want something that's going to hold my age. Now I deleted that hello world because we don't really need to say hello world. It age. 
Well, I'm going to pretend I'm really young. I'm 24 years old. Huh? All right. And then what is my height in centimeters? Like I really know. What is my height in meters? What is my height in yards? So I'm not going to do int yards because that would mean I'd be either one yard or two yards or three yards. And humans come in different sizes than just that. So I'm going to make it a floating point type. I could use float, reasonable, right? But as I said, the recommendation is to always use double just because they're more precise. So I'm going to say that this is in height, or no, I'm just going to say yards is equal to, and I'm kind of curious, you know, I think I'm about 70 inches in yards. I'm, so I'm going to say that I'm 1.944 yards. All right, so 1.944, just to have some floating point number there. There are other data types. There's really no reason to use it, but there's short, which is for smaller numbers between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000. I could use a short. I'm not going to. The general recommendation is always use an int unless you need a larger number. Now, what's a large number? What's a number larger than 2 billion? How about the population of the planet? It's larger than 2 billion. So we're going to need either a floating point type or a long, long. And since we're not going to say that there's fractional numbers of people, there's, you know, 8 billion and a half people, we're going to make it an integer type, long, long. Population equals, what is the current population? I don't know. 7.7 billion. All right, if I type in 7.7 .7 billion, that's not going to work because this is an integer type. So I'm going to have to figure out how many zeros there are in 7 billion. That's going to be uh, eight zeros after that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I believe that's correct. Right, because that would be thousands. That would be millions or hundred thousands. That would be millions. That would be billions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty, so we have three different variable types for holding three different pieces of data. How do you decide what kind of data do you type do you want, want for data? And like I just said, if it kind of ought to be a whole number, make it an int. Especially if it's a counter. If you're just counting, like, you know, the number of days, you know, or, you know, the number of items in a list. You're never going to say that there's 3.7 items in this list. So a lot of the variables you're going to make are ints. Just default to making an int, an int, unless it needs to be floating point, in which case make it a double, or unless it needs to be a long int, a lo larger int, in which case make it a long log. Now the book may not phrase recommendations exactly like that, so uh, but I am going to restate them. Just use int as a matter of course, unless it needs to be fractional, it needs a decimal point, use double, or it needs to be larger than 2 billion, use long long. I'm going to rearrange the order of those. Because once it's fractional, it can be bigger than 2 billion clearly. But you don't want to use doubles unless you need to, because like I said, rounding errors can kind of creep in, give you weird looking results. If you add a couple numbers together and you expect it to print out seven, but it prints out 6.9999999999, that's a rounding error. And we'd better print seven if that's what we're dealing with. Let's figure out how many people die a year and how many people are born a year, if we possibly can. I mean, and, and you know that's not strictly true, because as the population increases, maybe it increases geometrically or something like that. But maybe Google can tell us 
how many people die each year? World birth and death rates. Eight deaths per 1,000. I didn't want to know per 1,000. Yeah, we could probably figure that out. Eight divided by 1,000 times seven billion that's gonna be the number of people who die each year let me type that into Google and see if it looks reasonable that calculation six million people die a year could be and then so more people are born We'll repeat that calculation in a minute. So, death rate for the world, we're going to say is equal. Oh, what did that calculation actually come out as? Why don't we just say it's 6 million? Round it now. And then the birth rate, I'm going to do the same thing except it's not 8,000. 8, Per 1,000, it said it was my, I have a bad memory, 19. So we're going to go and type 19 in here. Stop laughing at me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Now we're going to say that that's 14 million people born each year. Mm -hmm. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Why are we going to do this? Because we're going to make it calculate an estimate of what the world's population is going to be. 10 years from now. So we need to add 6 million or subtract 6 million people from it and add 14 million people to it each year. I'm going to define those as numbers up above where we use them. So why don't we go back to our thing here and I'm going to make a variable a long, long variable. I could probably store that in int, right? Because it's less than 2 billion. So int b rate for birth rate is equal to, I've already forgotten that number, 14 million. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then int d rate is equal to, Six million. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I don't feel like typing the word population over and over and over, so I'm going to abbreviate it pop. So here's what we're going to do we're going to say pop equals pop plus B rate. That's how many people are born a year. And you know that this is not exactly correct, right? Because as the population increases, so does the number of people born each year. I should have actually used the formula. And then population is equal to population minus the death rate. That would be after one year. And I'm just going to print that out. C out, error, error, quote, after one year, pop equals, end quote, arrow, arrow, pop, arrow, arrow, E and D L, which stands for end of line. We can also do quote backslash in, end quote, but E and D L works. Now I'm going to copy and paste those things and just paste it a couple of times. And basically whenever you do copy and pasting a couple of times, you're not doing it right because you ought to make it a loop. But we haven't talked about loops, so I'm just going to copy and paste this, right? So what I did is I highlighted those lines by holding the shift key and pressing the down arrow. Shift, down, 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 or you can always use the mouse like we all know how to do. And I'm going to copy. I like command keys, so I'm going to hit control C for copy. And then I'm going to come down here and hit control V as like vehicle for paste. And I'm going to do that, I don't know, a couple of times. But then I need to change these messages, right? The first one says after one year, 
after how about after two years after three years after four years and after five years it looks like I pasted it four times is this font large enough for y'all in the back of the room y'all have binoculars then the very last thing in the program ought to be our pause command it's nagging the stickler in me to be putting these numbers in rather than the ratio that that page was doing but alright so I'm gonna run it see if it kinda looks good so after one year, you know, and we see the population going up. Pretty neat. What were we really showing off? We were just showing off picking some data types and creating variables. The key thing here, more important than anything else, is that before you use a variable, you have to have it defined and, and assigned. You have to have it declared and assigned. What do I mean? You can't add B rate to pop until you have a B rate, right? Now, this is more a fundamentals error than people who get into this class. But some people think that if you can just put that equation anywhere and it's going to start working, don't do what I just did, right? Well, I've got the formula in the program. Yeah, but it's not in the right place, right? It has to be in the right place where it's actually executed. It's not like a math paper where you can just define the formula once. You have to have the formula in the right place. So I'm going to undo those changes. All right. So here, this is called a declaration. Int age. That's a declaration right there. If I put a semicolon there, that's a declaration. You don't need to make this change. But I'm going to do it. And I'm going to add some comments. What I did is I added a semicolon there, and then I changed it to say age equals 24. I split the two things up. So this is a declaration. You didn't have to do that in Python. And this is an assignment, which you did have to do. If you do them both at the same time, rather than go, that's a declaration assignment. Right, that's too many syllables. That's called an initialization. Which means declaration plus assignment. The thing on the left hand side of the equal sign is an expression. An expression could just be a number, or it could be an equation, an algebraic formula like that. It could be a really long one. It could have a whole bunch of pluses and minuses and function calls and stuff like that. But it's still an expression. So generally, our syntax for doing data manipulation math is variable equals expression, where expression can be one or more things, you know, one or more values separated by mathematical symbols. So examples, right, x equals 1. That's an, an expression. 1 is an expression. x equals y times z. That's an expression. x equals pow y to the power of 3. That's an expression. And I'm just going to get a little bit more ridiculous. And then I'm going to stop with this. y plus z times 10 comma 3 minus c. That's an expression. Right. All of this is an expression, but it's kind of kind of got some sub expressions down in here. And I know that in your earlier programming classes, you talked about the rules of precedence, where multiplication is has a higher priority than addition and stuff like that. So if we break this down, we have these statements up at the top. What are those doing? 
You've probably got on your phone the idea that you could put an abbreviation in and it'll expand it to the uh, to the whole phrase, or maybe you've done that in computers, you know, where you go into the settings and you say RSC, and if you type in RSC, it expands it out to Rose State College, you know, a macro. This is kind of a macro that goes and opens a file somewhere called IOStream and inserts it into your source code. Now, you don't see it happen because it doesn't really happen to your source code, it creates a temporary file during the compilation process. But during that process, the file, IOStream, is included into with your file. And it's a way of bringing multiple pieces of a program together. And that's what this one does too. Include string. There's a file called string. And so during the compilation process, this pound sign include says replace this line with the contents of that entire file. We could probably see what that file looks like if we went in here, right clicked and do open document string, and it churn and it churn and see it's a lot of junk. I would not want to have to put that in my program every time I wanted to use a string. Yeah. Now in Python you didn't have to do that, right? If you wanted to say name equals Joe, you didn't have to do pound sign include string in order to get that to work. The more modern the language is, you know, the more data types they made as a default into it. But C++, being descended from C, which is a really old language, did not have a built-in string class. So we have to bring one in like that. That's what those mean. I'm closing the wrong thing. Don't close that. Then this statement as I said, what it means is that if it can't find that keyword, that word like C out, if it's not defined, it'll check to see if std colon colon is defined. And it is. For every, without that statement, we would have to do std colon colon there. We would have to do it there. I mean, I, I could take it out. We'd have to see all the changes. We would very quickly see all the changes we would have to make if I commented that line out. So everything that's underlined in red. And oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure I like it black on white. I mean, I love it for when I'm doing my own work, but I'm not sure that's the easiest to see on the screen. Maybe uh, next time I'll flip it to being, you know, the opposite colors and see whether y'all like it better, or whether it's easier for you to see on the projector. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that out. And then what is this int main business? Well, I know that if you did Python, and the majority of y'all did, but some people took fundamentals or whatever without having to, to take a programming language with it. This is a function name. Every C or C++ program you write has to have a main function. So every time we create a program, we're going to create a, a main function. That's just why we have to have that. And you have to put INT for what? What this does, very good question. You did take Python, right? No. Nope. Okay. For those who did, anyway, in those, in some languages, you define a function like this: define, like, get three, and then in that function, you would put this: return three, and then so later on, you could do this: a is equal to get three, and so it would call that function. It would jump up here. It would execute that line. Of code which returns a three and so by the time it was all done a equals three now would you do that no but it, it's more for multiplication right you know or or you know mathematical formulas where maybe you're gonna multiply two things together so I'm gonna write one that's a little bit more complicated for those of y'all who do, are familiar with this that we're gonna call this function multiply and it's gonna take and it's okay that this is more just let this wash over you if you want. Return a times b. So when we go down here and we call multiply and we pass in 10 and 4, then what this does is a function is a named block of code. It's one or more statements that have a name. That's its name. So whenever we want to run that function, we just use its name down here. And we pass it two pieces of data, which 
get fill in those variables. Those variables get multiplied by each other. They get returned, and then that gets stored there. So a function is just like if I get to tell you to go do something because I'm too busy to do it, right? So I say, multiply 10 and 4. You're the one who goes and runs, you know, and does that math, and then you return with the answer, and then I can run away with the answer. So that's what a function is. But this is in Python. And C, C++, you have to define what it's going to return. Python doesn't care whether you're returning a string or, or int or float or double or, or nothing. It doesn't care. But C does. So we would have to say int multiply. And we may actually put this into our code. We have a little bit more time, right? We're, we're not getting out of here. When are we getting out of here? My brain's broken. 8, 8.30? One minute. Okay, we're going to end our lecture. All right. So anyways, um, it looks like this. If we were going to write the same thing in C, it looks like this. And so this is the return type. It tells the compiler that when multiply is being called, it's going to return an int. And so A had better be ready to accept an int. And so int main just means that main could return an int. And it does, but it kind of disappears. It just goes into the operating system. And if you were doing system administration, you could check for error codes or stuff like that. But that's what that means. That's why you put an int there. Let's make a Dropbox. Sorry for losing track of time, guys. I was just having too much fun. And you're going, well, I wasn't. No, I'm kidding. All righty. Okay, so since the uh, due date for the homework zero slipped, I'm not going to give you all a second assignment. So you all are squeaking by. We'll start handing out the homework hot and heavy next week. And who didn't actually get this to work because you got syntax errors and I just kept rudely going on? Wave your hand. All right. I'm sorry, guys. I was lame. Please slow me down. Please say, hey, I'll bring candy and give it out to the people who slow me down. How about that? The class is going to go pretty slow at that point. You're right. You're going to get full credit even if it, even if it's just a blank piece of paper, right? Or a note that says I attended class. But it's nice if we get it working. And if you want to hang out for a few minutes, we will. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm happy to hang out. There's nobody who comes to this room after us. So there's a Dropbox called B. Go ahead and find your CPP file. If you remember how to do that, it's going to be wherever you told it to be. I think I stuck mine in the documents folder. So you just open up the B folder in assignments. Assignments, B, add a file, my computer, upload, and wherever you put it. I'm pretty sure I put mine in documents, Visual Studio and then B, and then B. I don't know why it says B and then B again, but it does. So I'm going to go in there, and I finally found my CPP file. So I'm happy. And then click Add, and then click Submit. Don't bother with screenshots during the lectures, because you're in a hurry to get out. Why, why bother? I know you did it, right? Yeah. I do want screenshots for the homework.